Good afternoon. Um, uh, on behalf of the McLean Center and the Center for Health and Social Sciences and the Buxbaum Institute, uh, David Meltzer and I are delighted to welcome you to today's lecture in the um, series on the present and future of the doctor-patient relationship. Um, I, I'm delighted to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Weiwei Li. Um, that Dr. Lee is the Assistant Dean of Students at Pritzker and an Associate Professor of Medicine in the General Medicine section. Um, uh, she earned her medical degree from New York University School of Medicine and a Master's of Public Health from the Harvard School of Public Health. Um, upon receiving her medical degree, Dr. Lee completed a residency in internal medicine uh, at New York Presbyterian Hospital, Weill Cornell, uh, where she served also as chief resident. At, at Pritzker, um, Dr. Lee is the director of the Wellness Initiative and leads programs to improve physician and trainee well-being. Um, as I said, Dr. Lee is a primary care physician, a researcher, an educator, a national expert on the intersection of technology, patient experience, and physician well-being. She's written many papers in this area. Uh, I'll give you one example, a paper called Patient Perceptions of Electronic Medical Record Use by Faculty and Resident Physicians, a mixed method study published a few years ago in the Journal of General Internal Medicine. In 2016, Dr. Lee was one of the three faculty here at the university to be appointed as a Buxbaum Institute junior faculty scholar. Um, she was selected for her dedication to patient care, collaborative decision making, and clinical excellence. In addition, Dr. Weiwei Li is a fellow of the Academy of Distinguished Medical Educators. Today, Dr. Li's talk is entitled, um, You, Me, and the Computer Make Three, the Doctor-Patient Relationship and the Electronic Medical Record. Uh, join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Weiwei Li. Thank you, Mark. Excellent. You got can, can you hear me in the back? Yes? Excellent. Let me, oh no, can you hear me now? Better? All right. Um, so thank you, Mark, for that really kind introduction. Um, I'm excited to be here today to talk a little bit about the research that I've been doing on the impact of EHR use on the patient-doctor relationship. And you know, this is a topic that is near and dear to my heart. As, um, as um, Dr. Siegler mentioned, I am a primary care doctor. So I spend a lot of my um, work week in a patient room, face-to-face um, -face with a patient in the clinic, right? Um, and I use that term face-to-face -face because I think there's a real tension in that. You know, the, the time I'm in the room with the patient, I'm also trying to manage the work that I'm doing in the EHR, right? Putting in the orders, reviewing the chart, and then documenting the notes so that I don't leave the clinic day with, um, you know, 20 notes I need to finish at the end of the day. Right? Um, so that dilemma and that tension between paying attention and focusing and connecting and engaging with the patient in the room um, and being pulled away by the demands of EHR are really what spurred um, me to kind of take a look into this as a, uh, a research question. So I actually want to start off and set the stage. We're going to watch this sh short video, um, which I'll start right now. Honey, look. What? He's playing doctor. Mm hmm How's it going, Doc? <laughs> yeah. That's doctor, all right. We better leave him to it. So, um, so that's a funny little clip that's actually part of a commercial for one of the EHR vendors out there. Um, but I think it really does encapsulate a kernel of truth there, right? Our concern as physicians that maybe we are paying more attention to that screen than, than the human being who's here to seek out our, um, our care in the, in the clinic room, right? So let's dig a little bit deeper into that question. So what is the impact of EHR use on the patient-doctor relationship? So to help us answer that question, I do what 
Um, most of our patients do when they have a question. I, I turn to Google, right? So let's go ahead and see what Google has to say about that. I put in the search terms electronic health record and um, patient-doctor relationship, right? Um, and on that first page of hits, um, what I actually saw was that there were many um, pieces and articles that were written about the impact of that relationship, and actually most of it skewed negative, right? So um, let me share with you one article. This is one that was written by Danielle Ofri, and she is an internist at NYU and also does a lot of writing in um, the New York Times and has written several um, books. Um, and she has a racy title to hers, right? The EMR has changed a doctor-patient duet into a menage a trois. Um, and this is really, you know, she writes about that erosion of the patient-doctor relationship and communication. So she talks about Doctors these days wrestling with the computer while the, while the patient gazes at the supply cabinet. And she talks about her efforts to maintain eye contact, but she finds that it's really almost impossible with what she has to do with the EHR to get through her day. Right? So you know, she has you know, written a couple of thought pieces about um, this type of work. Also, another um, you know, sort of uh, article or link that showed up on that Google hit was this recent survey conducted by Stanford Health, um, Stanford Medicine and the Harris Poll, where they surveyed primary care doctors. Right? Um, and one of the main findings around um, how doctors feel about the EHR um, was that they felt that the time they spent in the electronic medical record was having a potentially negative impact on their patient, right? And that they were spending more time in an EHR than they were with the patient. And about 70% of those um, doctors surveyed reported that the EHR increased the total, total number of hours that they were working, um, that it was contributing to burnout, and that using the EHR takes valuable time away from their patients, right? So, you know, there's, um, you know, Google is helping us identify some of the, the top themes that are rising up around this topic. Then there are other articles like this that come up, right? This is written by Atul Gawande, um, and this is, uh, was published in The New Yorker, and the title also is a little provocative, right? Why Doctors Hate Their Computers. Um, and you know, I think this really gets to the heart of when EHR was rolled out, when we you know, had um, you know, the incentives to, to try and make sure we're digitizing medical care, there was a lot of promise, and um, you know, promises to the profession and to patients that it would increase efficiency um, and, and make um, things better in many ways, and in many ways it has, right? But um, he, you know, Atul Gawande also posed the question, are screens coming between doctors and patients? So what I want to talk to you guys today about is um, we'll move a, a little bit away from Google and we'll talk uh, more about some of the research that's been done on EHR use and patient-doctor relationship. Um, I really hope that you guys will walk away with some, uh, a positive spin on this, about how we can integrate this technology that is here to stay um, and in a way that we can actually use the EHR as a tool to engage our patients. Um, and for us, I think, to really think about engaging our patients as partners. How can we empower our patients to um, help us engage better with the EHR when they're in the room with us? So, I think in order to get an understanding of the impact of EHR use on patient-doctor relationship, um, we need to understand, well, what is the scope of the problem? How much are physicians actually using the EHR? And luckily, yesterday, in the Annals of Internal Medicine, there was a paper published on this, right? So <laughs> um, you can get your CME uh, from this. <laughs> um, so this was published, um, and the title was Physician Time Spent Using the EHR During Outpatient Encounters. Um, and this was quite a large study. This study included 100 million patient encounters from 155,000 physicians from 417 health systems. Um, and the, the physicians here were using the Cerner EHR system. Okay? Um, and so what they found was that the average time physicians spent per patient encounter in the EHR was 16 minutes and 14 seconds, okay? So you can do the math and multiply that by the number of patients that you see in a typical day in your clinical practice, and that'll give you a sense of the amount um, of actual EHR work that's really contributing to that patient care. So let, let me ask you guys, so there's you know, a, a range in these means, right, of the, of the times that um, physicians spend in the EHR per encounter. Which specialties do you think might have the higher end of that as far as spending more time in the EHR per patient encounter? Any thoughts? Primary care. Primary care. Any other thoughts? Radiology. Radiology. Interesting. Other thoughts? Oncology. Oncology. Excellent. Okay, and what, what do you think the fields might be that maybe spend um, a, a lower amount of time on average in the EHR? Surgery. 
surgery, okay? Anything else? Psychiatry. Psychiatry. So let's take a look. So um, I, thought this, I thought this was an interesting kind of piece of that as well. Highest mean time, 18 to 22 minutes for um, our gerontologists, right? Endocrine was spending a significant amount of time in the EHR, primary care and internal medicine fields, right? Um, the lowest mean time was actually the sports medicine, okay, and, and PM&R. So, you know, we can see that there was quite, quite a lot of variation, obviously, in this data um, that they were able to find. But this is really the most comprehensive study out there um, to date, as of yesterday, um, about the, the, the time that really is involved with EHR use and, and patient doctor um, interactions and communication and time spent. Um, so let's think about this a little bit more, right? So when we started off looking at this research question, um, 2012, 2013, our uh, our healthcare system here in the outpatient clinic was actually just rolling out the um, EPIC in our clinical practice. Um, and we wanted to really understand, well, what is the impact? How, will, how, how can we expect to know what the, um, you know, what the repercussions are going to be for EHR use and patient doctor communication? And what we actually found was that um, we took a look in the literature, and there really wasn't a, a systematic review that took a look at this information. So we decided to go forth, and our first research question was, let's take a look at the literature and see what we can draw from the studies that have been done. So a good number of these studies that we included in the review um, were actually observational studies. So um, these were studies where the um, researchers put a camera in an exam room and watched patients and doctors interact while they used the EHR, right? And then they had the researchers then code the different behaviors and sort of note, um, you know, what, what it is that happened um, during that encounter. So what was uncovered was that there was a lot of um, behaviors that detracted away from patient-doctor communication and relationship, right? They saw um, through this, um, you know, these, these, these video studies that the physicians often had their back to the patients. Um, poor eye contact uh, definitely results from that, right? Um, when, when docs are looking up information in the health record, there could be long silences. Um, and, you know, hence uh, Danielle Ofri is talking about patients staring off at the cabinets, right? Um, the screen is often not visible to the patient, so there's not a lot of transparency um, in what the doctor is doing in the chart. Um, when patients were bringing up sensitive topics during the visit, the patient, uh, the physician could be seen typing in the computer, so doing um, work that doesn't signal that they are um, fully engaged with what the patient is saying. And then there's just this idea of computer-guided questioning, right? This is, um, you know, sort of not having a human level conversation with a patient in the exam room. It's more using like a checklist to make sure that your view assistance of back pain is sort of covered, right? So these were some of the concerns that sort of came up um, along the way as far as behaviors that could impede patient-doctor relationship and communication. Um, it wasn't all bad though, right? A lot of these video um, studies actually showed um, positive behaviors that could help improve patient-doctor relationship. Um, and some of them were just, you know, physicians who were very intentional about sharing the screen and inviting the patients in to engage in understanding their trends over time by, you know, graphing results or weight or BMI, um, really incorporating the tools that are built into to our EHRs, um, things like shared decision-making tools to help people better understand what their treatment options and what might be a good fit for them and their values, right? Um, the simple act of explaining what you're doing um, while you're doing it, so talking out loud so you avoid some of those awkward silences that happen when you're, when you're looking for you know, material and information in the chart, and then really proactively using that computer to engage patients, right? But I also want to go back to our central question um, for the systematic literature review, which was taking a look at um, you know, what can we glean from the, the um, research that's been done already on this topic. And I want you to remember, we did this study starting in 2012, 2013. So we were looking backwards in the literature at um, EHR use and patient-doctor relationship. Um, and this was really before the widespread, you know, um, massive adoption of EHR. And right now in the U.S., we are at adoption rates in outpatient clinics well above 90, 95%, right? Um, the era that these studies were done in was really much more um, in the sort of beginning of the integration of EHR. So there's still, I think, a lot more that we can probably learn from um, taking a look at the, the recent literature on this as well. Um, but as far as our study is concerned, we um, included 53 studies that met our inclusion criteria. Um, and we were really interested and saw um, and found that there were only 22 studies out of those that actually um, evaluated and asked about patient satisfaction with patient-doctor relationship or um, you know, communication out of 
that. And of those, um, it was actually, there was a neutral impact for the most part. Most of the um, patient uh, uh, results showed that they felt there was no change in a relationship or communication or that um, even, you know, five reported a positive impact, right? So. There's a little bit of a, 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 you know, kind of dissonance there because a lot of the observations and um, some of the uh, patient and physician comments and feedback about EHR and interference with um, communication and relationship wasn't necessarily being reflected in that um, patient satisfaction piece when you look at the studies. But remember, you know, these are a very small number of studies done before there was, you know, much more widespread use. So this is take this with a grain of salt, right? Um, so you know, I I thought that was, you know. Pretty, pretty encouraging to start with. Um, so we decided to then actually dig a little bit deeper and take a look at our own um, healthcare system here, right? Um, and as I sort of mentioned earlier, 2012 was around the time that we were implementing Epic um, EHR into our outpatient clinic. And so this was actually a perfect time for us to kind of study um, our patient perceptions of integration of EHR. So um, what we were able to do was we um, interviewed patients of faculty um, and residents in the primary care clinic, so internal medicine um, residents, um, and ask them a series of questions about the EHR and their relationship and communication, right? Um, and we did this by doing a phone call with patients about a, a year after the EHR was rolled out. So um, what did we find, right? Of these 108 interviews that we conducted, um, <clears throat> we found that, again, overall, the patients were nonplussed about it. They, they told us, you know what, you know, we like the EMR big picture. We love that it really simplifies some of the clinical functions, right? Um, patients told us they can see all the notes from the other doctors and they really work together as a team. I love it, right? So they could see the benefit of having an EHR in the, um, in the clinic by allowing their, their physicians to work together and to have access to information easily. Um, but many of the negative comments that emerged from these interviews that we were able to code were around communication, right? And about physical focus, right? So one patient told us, um, I mean, I know they are not on Facebook, right? But I don't know what they're doing, right? This idea of transparency being important to our patients is, is key, right? They want to know that when you are um, typing away at the screen there, um, that you're doing something that's, that's um, you know, helping them in their patient care. Um, and they are really asking for more of that transparency transparency and screen sharing, right? So in thinking about this, um, and looking at the results from the literature review and taking a look at the results from the Our Patient Perspective study here, um, I think what we walked away with was the idea that there's a real gap here. You know, there are some, uh, you know, negative behaviors that emerge um, from the studies of observing patient doctors and EHRs, but there's also a lot of positive behavior that's not being emphasized, not being taught. And there was no curricular or training that we were aware of that um, helped trainees, students, residents, um, and faculty really um, sort of integrate these best behaviors to communication with EHR. So we set out to develop that, right? And we did that because we wanted to avoid a situation like this, right? So um, this is an article that was written um, in 2012 um, in JAMA and as a perspective piece. And it's entitled The Cost of Technology, right? Um, so this was actually a drawing that was made by a pediatric patient. Um, and the patient gave this to um, his pediatrician at, their, at, at her next visit, right? Um, and the pediatrician in this case is actually a trainee and, um, and a resident um, who was practicing at Brown at that time, um, who was actually seen as a humanistic role model to many of his colleagues, as someone who was incredibly empathetic, who you know, had really great patient communication skills, and um, patients really loved him. When the resident got this picture, he was devastated, right? Because what do you see here? You see um, this beautiful child who's in to see um, her doctor. She's sitting on the exam. You know, exam table there. She's got you know really awesome, colorful, maybe mermaid dress on, right? Her her family sitting behind her in that purple chair. She's got a younger sibling, maybe a mom there. And then there there he is. There's the primary care doctor. What what is he doing? What's he doing? He's on the computer. He's got his back to them, right? And she's like put him in the position of typing and like you know working furiously away at that computer there, right? Um, so. These things are important. These optics are incredibly important to our patients. This is what a child has taken away from her visit with her doctor, who she um, has a really good relationship with, right? So 
in thinking about the education sort of opportunities that we can teach these skills, I think we can really um, think about using those positive findings we found from the literature of you to, you to build these curricula. That also got us to thinking about, um, you know, patient-centered care, right? What does patient-centered care look like in the digital age? Um, and you know, this is the um, National Academy of Medicine's definition of patient-centered care, right? Care that's respectful, and you know, seeing patients as um, individuals with preferences, needs, and values that guide their clinical decisions. How can we, as a um, you know, as a, a cadre of physicians and medical educators, really think about infusing this into our clinical interactions with our patients, right? And it's important because patient-centered care has been found to improve um, not just patient satisfaction and, and adherence to medications, but also health systems factors like um, resource utilization or cost or risk of litigation, right? So um, I, you know, this is an important and timely question for um, us as a medical education community. So we wanted to move away from the idea that patient-centered care means, you know, docs on their devices and the patient, you know, sort of um, in the middle there uh, as, as we kind of tend to our, um, our EHR work, right? So that got us to really think about um, this idea of bedside manner, right? So um, doctors across, you know, many, many years have asked themselves, how, how, is, how is your bedside manner? How is my bedside manner? How do patients um, feel that I engage with them? How do I communicate with them? How do I connect with my patients? And how do I make them feel, right, um, when I am seeing them and working with them on their health? So I you know, want you guys to really think about um, how we interact with doctors and patients, you know, in our modern age. We have a doctor, one of my favorite doctors here um, from, uh, from the ER days, and then you have your lovely patient, right, um, in the exam room waiting to see you um, and, and, and having concerns they want to talk about with you together. But you always now these days have an EHR as well, right? So in updating this concept, I really think that we need to ask ourselves, um, what is your computer side manner, right? So what is it um, in our day and age, in the, in the digital age with EHR use, um, how patients see you is going to have a lot to do with how well you can navigate um, the work and the important things you're doing in EHR with the communication and the integration of um, the patient into that um, visit and to be able to provide the, um, the you know, education that they need on the health conditions and the advice that they have come to seek you out for, right? So the computer side manner becomes an incredibly important concept, I think, um, as we move forward in thinking about um, clinical skills. So, from the best practices that we found in the literature review um, and from some of the work that we'd also done with patient perspectives and, and taking into account um, the, the opportunity to speak with our patients about how we could do it better here in our own clinic, we actually came up with uh, the skeleton for our curriculum, um, which was um, based around these best practices that we call the human level. Um, and this really, I think, helps us to encapsulate some of the behaviors and the very teachable skills that we can impart on trainees and to challenge ourselves to do better in the exam room, right? Um, you know, it starts off with H, which is something that, you know, is about honoring the golden minute, right? Walking into the exam room and, and making that completely technology free, right? You, you greet the patient, you um, ask what, you know, what brings them in, you um, make that human connection with the patient before you even sort of log on to that computer. Um, and then, you know, the U is the triangle of trust piece, which really sets you up for success in the exam room. So you want to be able to make sure that the screen is set up for sharing with your patient. So you want to put that computer screen in the top of the apex of the triangle where both you and the um, patient can see it together so you can sort of work together as you're um, going through the visit, right? Um, and then the other things like maximizing patient interaction um, and then importantly acquainting, so, acquainting yourself with their chart are really important as well. So do your homework. Know what you want to go into that visit um, talking about so that you're actually prepared to use the tools in the EHR to make that visit um, uh, efficient and to, and to synthesize what you want to do as a provider with what um, needs and, and ideas and things that your um, patient wants to talk about at that visit, right? Um, so next the screen really is about when a patient has a a, 
sensitive topic that comes up to completely disengage from the computer. Your hands have to come off the keyboard, you have to turn and face them, you have to you know, really signal with your body language that you are attending and listening and um, with them in that moment, right? Um, and then inviting the patient to look on. Make sure you're, you're um, engaging eye contact. There's some really interesting studies that take a look at uh, physician eye movements, um, and, um, and they've actually seen some gender differences in this, you know, where um, they find that um, male physicians who are using the computer in the exam room have a, more of a tendency to just um, have their eyes sort of stick more to the screen, and there's less saccading sort of back and forth with the eye contact with the patient um, th than, than sort of uh, female physicians that they've studied on this. So it's just something interesting to think about, right? And then valuing the computer, so not bad-mouthing the EHR, right? Because we all know that the EHR is not going away, and how do we figure out a way to think about the positive attributes for our patients so that you don't sort of cloud the overall sort of mood of that encounter. And of course, explaining what you're doing, talking out loud, and then logging off um, the computer so that the patient's um, information is secure is incredibly important, right? So these are kind of the core um, pieces that we put together for the, um, for the curricula that we, that we had um, and is still ongoing. So the training that we um, ended up um, developing was a, started with the medical student curriculum where we started with second year medical students um, and it was very intentional to start with second year medical students. Um, you know, they are eager and fresh and learning the core concepts of clinical skills and they have not been tainted necessarily by, you know, by watching others do things in a way um, that may be less than ideal. We want them to kind of start off on the right foot and learn, um, learn sort of the best practices and the research behind this. So we um, deliver a one hour lecture in the clinical skills curriculum and then have the medical students engage in a, a group OSCE, right? And this is where um, they are in the role of the physician and they work with a standardized patient. Um, and then they have um, a group of peers that are observing them as well as a faculty preceptor. Um, and in this way, they're getting feedback about their behaviors, about engaging the EHR from both the standardized patient as well as um, peer observers. So what we found was that the um, curriculum was very well received, right? Um, there was a significant increase um, pre and post um, OSCE of the students' reported level of training, knowledge, and skills on this topic, and um, close to 100% of them thought this should be required. So it was something they felt was needed in their curriculum. Um, what was also super interesting was that the um, first year we did this, we actually rolled out the OSCE to our third year students um, who at that time had received no training. And the training was really just that one hour lecture, right? So these third year students were at the end of their clinical year, they had done all their clerkships where they had a year long of experiences working with patients in the exam room trying to use the computer, all that in real life, right? So we gave those third year students at the end of their third year the same OSCE. Okay, and then we wanted to compare um, the performance with the second year students who received the lecture. And what we found was that the second year students were actually rated higher than the third year students on these, um, on these behaviors to include the patient, engage the patient with the EHR, right? And that when you took a look at the capstone question, the student's ability to use the EMR to um, enhance patient provider communication, again, the second year students um, were rated um, as being able to do this um, at a higher level than the second year students. So, um, in building on this, so we were able to um, put together and package our curriculum and publish on MedEd Portal to try and disseminate some of the work and the curricular training we were doing on this. And then the next question we have, okay, well, let's move up to the next level of learner. We wanted to try and talk about um, the, the residents and how we can engage the residents in sort of this training and curricula as well. So we started off with internal medicine and pediatrics um, residents and inserted it into some of their um, lectures through um, their noon conferences. But we also wanted to capture a larger audience, right? How do we sort of reach the, the other residents and, um, and fellows who are here at our institution? And there's so many constraints related to the time they have for education. How do we get them all together? They're all in different departments, right? So um, we were able to partner with our EPIC trainers here. So you may all be familiar, right? We, um, as any uh, new member of a, an institution, you need to be um, trained in an electronic health record to be able to use it to provide clinical care. And these trainings are usually quite long. I think the outpatient um, clinic training is something like four to eight hours, right? So we were able to train the EPIC um, trainers to insert 15 minutes of content on communication skills, right, into this required training. Um, and they um, were able to roll this out and help us understand, um, you know, whether or not this was helpful for, for our, um, our GME uh, cohort here, 
right? So in 2015, um, we were able to train about 160 residents and fellows um, and interns and, you know, sort of all across different specialties um, here at the medical center. And about 32 of those um, uh, participants were in the primary care fields. And what we found was that there was also a significant increase in, the, um, in their knowledge of the barriers, best practices, and ability to implement um, these patient-centered EHR skills. Um, and, you know, the vast majority thought that the training was effective, that it should be required, and that it would change their future practice, right? Again, not a perfect study. This is, you know, just looking at the impact of a curricular pre and post. Um, the real meat of the matter would be to um, be able to take a look at some of the patient um, perceptions and interactions after some of this training is done, and, and that's something we hope we're, we're hoping to do later down the line, all right? So then we kind of moved on. So we were able to, um, to synthesize sizes and sort of publish this if you want to learn more about it. The, um, the article is out there. But the faculty training piece, I think, was the last piece we wanted to get at because I think in order to create um, a culture where EHR use is used in a way that includes the patients and engages them, you really need to focus on faculty training as well, right? So they're able to teach these skills, to give feedback in a timely and meaningful way to the trainees. Um, but it's very challenging to do um, faculty development and sort of CME work around this stuff because it's very labor intensive. Um, so we uh, were able to partner with the Cleveland Clinic to do a study with them as well on faculty training. And we proposed and were able to um, roll out a study that involved a very short, you know, sort of lunchtime lecture on the best practices and then um, asked the faculty to do a, a standardized patient encounter. And we were like, oh my gosh, the faculty are going to hate this, right? Like when's the last time a faculty member had to do a standardized patient encounter? It might be never right? Um, but we uh, were really surprised and um, really pleased to know that at the end of the, um, the OSCE training, you know, we had faculty members also do a group OSCE, right, where they were able to interact with a standardized patient and had two or three of their peers observe and give feedback. Faculty loved this. You know, they loved seeing their peers in practice um, and to, you know, pick up some tips and tricks and to kind of observe what worked well, what doesn't work well. Um, and this was actually their favorite part of the training, which I think was really reassuring. Um, and then we, we found that, again, the um, faculty reported that their awareness of best practices and barriers really went up, but also, you know, importantly, their ability to teach trainees, they felt much more confident after after, the, um, after the, the faculty development session, right? So beyond that, we began developing more tools around how we can help our trainees um, learn some of these skills and get feedback. So we developed a direct observation tool that faculty can use with residents or students in the exam room. You know, we have to do this direct observation as part of our um, medical education um, oversight of trainees. And so this is a tool that we developed and we're able to validate um, to use this as a way to give feedback based on that human level mnemonic and best practices, right? Um, so we uh, were able to validate some of this with um, the video footage that we had of students and um, students doing OSCEs, um, and we're able to, to find that this was a reliable tool to use to measure patients under EHR use. Um, lastly, we put together a series of CME videos and patient experience videos that are available for free um, for institutions that wanted to, um, you know, think about rolling out this type of training for their um, faculty or students or residents. And it's available for free on the doctor's channel. Um, and you can sort of see that there's one video where we interview patients about what they, you know, think about their patients using the e their doctors using the EHR and sort of come away with some really interesting um, sort of takeaways from that. Um, and then just a, a, a over overall sort of CME training video that we you know, people could use for um, faculty development and resident training. But the last piece I want to um, talk a little bit about is thinking about um, awareness, right, and advocacy around patient-doctor EHR use and impact on um, communication and relationship. So this project has been really fun in sort of thinking about how it develops, right? We initially started with medical students, moved on to training for residents, right, and then um, we're able to do some faculty training training um, here at our institution at Cleveland Clinic. But the, um, the piece that's left out of this type of thinking and, and relationship is the patient, right? So we wanted to think about a way to engage our patients and to really empower them to um, speak up when we are not doing uh, quite as good of a job as we should be doing, right? Um, and to uh, use it in a, uh, and to sort of develop a tool that would be um, engaging and sort of captivating for, for our patients. So we were able to to, um, work with a, a really uh, wonderful comic artist um, who is based out of um, Northwestern, 
learn. Um, and she helped us sit down and really think about the core things we wanted to communicate via a comic, right? In a way that's um, you know, fun and colorful and allows patients kind of be drawn into this idea. So you'll see she helped us actually develop two comics, right? The first comic that you guys see on your left is Computers in the Clinic, Your Role. Um, and this is something that we want to use as a patient education tool. So we summarize our tips for patients um, through an ABC model, right? A, ask to see the screen. If, you're, if your provider isn't sharing the screen, it's your right to ask. It's your, it's your medical information, right? B, become involved. Right? Review your records with your doctor and ask questions. You know, um, you, know you, you as a patient can be like, oh, can we just look at our medications and make sure that, that, that those are entered correctly or my problem list or um, you know, what else has been going on there, right? And then calling for attention. This really um, gives them the permission to say, hey, you know, doc, I'm talking about something that's really important to me right now. Um, can you, can, can you just focus on me and, and maybe not do that computer work right now, right? It allows them to empower themselves to um, ask for the attention that they need um, in those moments that are critical to them, right? And then um, you'll see a, a sort of parallel comic that's on your right here. This was a comic that we developed for the faculty, um, and um, it's kind of a setup as a scenario of which would you prefer, right? There's a panel, um, you know, the vertical column on the left, and then the um, column on the right. The one on the left is maybe things that are, you know, a, a way to do things that is not as patient-centered, right? Um, so part of it is really I'm trying to encourage the, the physicians to use the EHR to, to do active chart review with the patient, to review recent labs, look at the A1C trends, help the patient understand patient education resources, um, and do that sort of in the exam room. Um, and so what we did was we were able to take these comics um, and then and then study them, right? So um, for this part of the study, we targeted pediatric um, faculty and patients as well as internal medicine faculty and patients. Um, and so for the provider perspective, we just put the comic up in the provider workrooms where they have their computers and they were, they were do, doing their documentation in between visits, right? For the patients, we actually um, gave the patients the comic right before they saw their doctors. Um, and then that was it. We gave them the, the, the comic and said, hey, we have a survey for you to fill out afterwards um, about, you know, if this comic helped you think differently about your encounter and your visit with your doctor, if you, if you did anything differently because of it. And then we asked a subset of those patients if we could call them in about three months to ask um, if they still remembered the comic and it had a lasting impact on them. Um, and what we found was um, that at the end of the visit um, that they had with, the, with their doctor after the comic was given to them, they actually, the majority of them, 75% reported the comic, encouraged them to be more engaged. And what we thought was really important was that um, when we took a look at some of the demographic information, we found that um, Asian American, Hispanic patients, those from a lower educational attainment, and then women were actually more likely to engage um, in some of the skills that we were, um, we were advocating on the a comic um, during that clinic visit with their doctor. So they were more likely to ask to see the screen um, or to you know, call attention to um, something if they needed to. Right? So I think this is, could be a very powerful tool for us to think about reaching out to a patient population um, may, that maybe has lower health literacy or um, that you know, is a very short and quick intervention by giving out this comic to really allow them to, um, to uh, fully participate in that exam room visit. Right? Um, and then for the phone follow-up portion of this, we called the patients, you know, three months after they got this comic and said, hey, um, do you remember this comic? And about 100, you know, close to 100% um, did, about 98%. Um, and, and most of them were able to recall um, at least one or two of the um, ABCs. And um, we also asked them if they had continued their behavior change, right? Were they, um, you know, continuing to ask to see the screen? Were they, you know, using these tools at subsequent doctor's visits they'd had in the interval? Um, and yes, and, you know, the majority of the patients did also tell us that, that they were continuing to use these skills um, even after the, the short intervention of the comic. Um, and then some patient comments, I think, were really informative as well. Um, you know, one patient told us the comic was great because I didn't know it was my right to look at the computer, right? I mean, the patients just were not aware that they could you know, ask for that um, engagement and that level of participation in their care. Um, and then patients often feel like they are rushed, and the comic gives them assurance that it's OK to ask questions. Um, and another patient tells us, you know, I see some improvements in provider behaviors already, right? Um, and that's really more referring to maybe some of the, the um, educational work we're doing with faculty and the comic advocacy we're doing with them as well there. 
So you know, we think that that's sort of a promising avenue to kind of uh, you know include the the patient in that discussion around patient doctor relationship in EHR. I, I don't know how many of you have seen this. Um, this piece in um, Annals, this is um, of internal medicine. This is a graphic medicine piece that they have. Um, and this was published a few years back. It's called, you know, they entitled it Today's Doctor-Patient Relationship, right? I think any of us who has worked in the hospital or in the clinic um, with trainees knows that the majority of the time we can find our trainees in that workroom in front of a computer screen doing important work, taking care of patients, putting in orders, managing things that need to happen for the patient, right? But this is, you know, kind of the reality of what we see a lot on the day to day. And I hope today um, in my conversation and sort of talk about some of the work that I do around EHR use um, and how we can use that as a tool to engage patients and promote communication and relationship um, that we can, you know, start thinking about how do we turn this tide a little bit, right? Um, and again, remember the studies show that the patients actually are quite neutral and maybe positive to really thinking about how the EHR can help enhance that relationship. So it's a real opportunity. I think for us to, um, you know, through medical education, through feedback from patients, through um, patient engagement in this type of work, to be able to um, improve patient doctor relationship by using the EHR. So, you know, I would say um, in conclusion, you know, the, um, I think what we found through our research journey was that the EHR can be used as a tool to really actively engage patients, to allow you to do um, really meaningful patient education. Um, and to connect with your patients if you are able to use the tools in the right way. Um, and that there are best practices from the literature that we can really learn from, that you can integrate um, easily into curricula and training, and that the important part is not just giving that one-time training, but really um, being very proactive in your assessment of how you interact with patients, I and mean, getting feedback and giving feedback to your trainees about how we can continue to do this better, right? I mean, just remember back to that drawing that was made by that child and the pediatrician. You guys have a real opportunity to shape um, you know, how your patients perceive you by how you interact um, you know, with the computer, um, with them in the exam room. And then lastly, um, really thinking about our patients as real partners in this, engaging them in a meaningful way in how we are using the EHR. Um, and you know, for me, that often means that you know, I like to document in the room, because if I don't write some of my note while I'm there seeing the patient, that means I go home and I have 12, 20 notes that I need to finish at the end of the day. And I have a really cute four-year-old that I want to see for dinner when I get home. Um, and he doesn't want me to be on the computer writing my notes, right? So what is the happy medium? Like, how can we get our trainees to really understand that documenting the room is OK? I mean, I feel like it's just got to be a reality of our practice these days. How do you do that in a way where your patients feel, hey, like, my doctor's telling me what they're doing. They showed me some of these really cool x-rays I had recently. They talked to me about the cardiology note. They pulled it up. They showed me the side effects of the new medicine. How can we do it in a way that the patients feel like this is a plus plus for them? That's value added for them. Um, and then also in really thinking about um, you know, how is it that um, you know, we can turn this documentation into something that actually helps us and our patients, right? So for me, when I document in the room, I focus on the HPI and the assessment and plan, right? For the HPI, I, you know, I ask the patient what their concerns are, and I have them talk a little bit about um, what they want to talk about, and I'll add that to the problem list, and I just take very short bullet point notes um, about sort of the main points, and then I summarize it. I'm like, okay, so we talked about this, this, and this. And then at the end, when I'm doing the assessment and plan, I use that as another opportunity. I say, hey, I'm going to write this down, so I I know that we're clear on what it is we talked about today. We talked about your blood pressure. Remember, we're going to stop the amlodipine today and have you come back in a month. So I actually like go by and write the assessment plan with the patient. And I'll often will just copy and paste that into the patient instructions so that when they leave in Epic, they are printed, um, you know, the summary of what we talked about at the visit. Um, when they and leave um, so that at the end of the visit they have something that they can take with them to remember what it is we discussed today. So there are ways I think that we can make the tool work as a way to engage patients and have them remember um, that interaction is very positive and I think those are opportunities we can continue to explore. So none of this work could have been possible without my, um, my co-investigators, Lolita Al-Qureshi um, in the pediatrics department and, um, and Vinnie Aurora, who's been um, working with us as our mentor on this project for many years now. Um, 
<laughs> and I love this cartoon from The New Yorker, you can't list your iPhone as your primary care physician. I know many, many, uh, many patients are, you know, are out there and, uh, and this maybe is the future of technology, who knows, right? <laughs> the future of patient-doctor relationships. Um, so again, acknowledging the, um, the Merits Fellowship and um, funding from the Buxman Institute, which has given a lot um, of um, grants to us over the years to continue to study this project. Um, and, uh, and at this point, um, you know, asking you guys if you have any questions, anything I can help um, answer about this topic. And um, if you're interested, uh, I'm happy to share any resources that I talked about today. Feel free to email me, reach, reach out to me on Twitter. Um, and I will end there. Are there any questions that I can help answer about this topic? David, yes, this of course, David. Yes. Um, um, have you seen any research on how the changing burden of the electronic health record affects things like um, people falling behind in the notes and the burden out? Yes. Like, have, have you thought about that as an outcome of some of these? Yeah, you know, um, I think that's a really important question. There's more and more research that's done on um, on this idea of the impact of EHR on burnout, right? Um, and you know, uh, Chris Sinsky at the AMA has done a lot of work on um, trying to quantify that and study that in a in a rigorous way. Um, so she's, you know coined this idea of pajama time, right? That's the time that we as physicians spend after hours in our pajamas finishing up our charting and EHR work, um, you know, outside of the regular clinic hours. Um, so I think it would be really meaningful because we do know that patient-doctor relationship and positive interactions with patients can be very protective against burnout. Um, and so trying to understand whether or not, uh, you know, engaging and enhancing, um, you know, the, the ways that patients and doctors interact with EHR could could maybe be a mediator in that, and there's not really been too much that's been published on that aspect of it. Yes? Just to follow up David's question, has anybody studied the relationship between the electronic record and the physical examination? Ah, that's a great question. That seems like something Abraham Varghese might have done. <laughs> It's sort of up his alley. You know, um, Abraham Varghese at Stanford um, is, uh, you know, sort of well known for his um, physical diagnosis um, training and advocacy, but is also, you know, a prolific writer. Um, and I don't know if he's actually, you know, he's done he's done some writing on EHR and the impact on patient-doctor relationship and what he calls the eye patient. So the eye patient is a, to a, a term that he coined to refer to the patient that we are taking care of as an icon in the computer screen, um, as opposed to the patient who is sitting in front of us. Um, I don't think he's actually made a direct link between um, EHR use and physical diagnosis, but that's certainly something that's very interesting, I think, to, um, to investigate further. Um, thanks very much for your talk. It was great. Um, one, one of the things that I see happening, so I'm in surgery, so one of the workarounds for not uh, spending time on the EHR is to have scribes. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. so, so is this seen as positive or negative? Is, has there been any assessment about how this impacts uh, patient satisfaction? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so you ask a great question, which was a question we asked ourselves a few years ago as well. Um, and so a lot of the scribe literature that's out there is actually um, targeting subspecialties like surgery, um, emergency room, um, and then different, um, different practices that are not necessarily primary care related. We know from those studies, a lot of those take a look at sort of the economics of it. You know, is it cost effective? Are, are we getting our return on investment in having a scribe by allowing the surgeon or the ER doctor to see more patients, um, you know, per clinic session, per ER session, whatever it might be? And the answer is yes, usually is very, it is cost effective um, when you're thinking about um, certain, certain specialty fields. Um, but we were actually able to, um, to pilot a study in our primary care clinic here of a scribe um, for uh, five faculty physicians um, who were working with the scribe over a three month period. Um, and we took a look at both patient and um, provider satisfaction. It was a study we published uh, last year and it was published in the um, journal, Journal Internal Medicine. And what we found was that the patients were totally okay with having a scribe in the room. And that might be because we are an academic institution, right? So they're used to having learners in the room, sometimes residents, um, lots of bodies in there that are helping with the care team. And so this idea of team-based care is one that I think the scribe model will really um, sort of continue to add to. But it's just a Band-Aid, right? Like not every practice is gonna be able to have a scribe to really help them with some of this documentation work. Um, but you know, this is also where the future of um, technology and the future of the patient-doctor relationship 
that may sort of converge, right? There's um, a lot of uh, uh, funding going into um, artificial intelligence, so AI, um, in being able to maybe like have a Siri-like device listening to your patient encounter and to have that somehow auto-generate into the right field into a note to help you document some of the things that need to be in that note. Um, and I don't think it's science fiction. That, that research is happening now. Um, but at the same time, you know, it really begs us to ask the question of the EHR, like, who are we serving with it, and what is it that um, we need to sort of take back as physicians who are using this on a day-to-day -day basis to um, make sure that the patients are front and center and all that. So the scribe question is really important. Um, but again, I, I, I still do think that um, it's probably not a resource available to the majority of physicians who are practicing, um, and that it, it is a workaround to a system that's, that's too clunky right now. Yes. That's, that's a great question. That's, that's really important. We, we don't want to, um, you know, sort of um, jeopardize any other patients, you know, right to, you know, their health information being secure. Um, but I think that if you get into a habit of practice where you're able to, I mean, I wouldn't say the whole time you're in the visit you should, like, be, like, showing them everything that you're doing. But I think there are key times in the visit when you want to do that. And for me, those key times are the HPI where I can actually document and talk to them about that. And and then at the end, um, in the assessment and plan, where I can summarize and make sure they understood what it is I want them to take away from that visit. Um, and then I'll do it also sort of hodgepodge in between when I'm looking at their, you know, their chart and their labs and whatnot. But I'm also very intentional when I'm when I'm in the room and I first log in. I use my tap badge, you know, so I use my um, my my tap badge to log into the system, so I'm not sort of trying to key in my password and all that. I let that sort of you know sort of run while I'm trying to you know get acclimated and, and, and get to, to figure out what's been happening with the patients since, since I last saw them. Um, and then um, once I'm in the chart, I actually open up their chart first, and I just make sure there's no, no more of those other fields open. But you do have to be intentional about it because you know we work in a health system where you know many of my patients are um, are employees here, um, and you know you don't want to put the the risk for anybody, not just people who work here, but for any of your patients um, by sharing that inappropriately. But I think it, it can be done in a in a safe way. Yes. Yes, Wikipedia, yes. Good question. Yeah, so there is this idea of distracted doctoring. So there's been, you know, there's been, um, perspective pieces written about it and um, case studies written about it, um, but there's not really, uh, you know, sort of a definitive research study that, that takes a look at it more systematically. Um, it was written up in the New York Times, you know, about five or six years back about distracted doctoring. Um, and, it, you know, they compare it to, you know, distracted driving, right? When you are driving and you're using your, your cell phone and you're texting, you're going to get into an accident, right? This is like a core tenet of, like, driver's ed, right? Um, and so I feel like seeing patients should be no different, right? Trying the best you can to um, again, you know, try and stay as focused and as intentional in your use of the computer as an education tool, as a way to, you know, sort of, you know, provide that um, that level of communication engagement that's meaningful for your patient. Um, I think has to be sort of front and center. There have been some um, case reports published. The one that comes to mind is um, one where um, they talked about a, a physician. Um, I think it was a trainee who um, had gotten a page about um, about discontinuing a patient's um, warfarin medication because their blood Thinner, that's a blood thinner that you have to monitor, you know, a, a blood test for to make sure it's in the right therapeutic range. If that range is too high, your patient's going to be at higher risk of bleeding. Um, and so this resident had gotten a page about stopping the INR because the stopping the, the warfarin medicine because the INR, which is a lab test, was too high. Um, what they found was that the um, the resident. Um, started putting in that order, but got distracted and started texting on her cell phone and never um, got back around to canceling that order, and that patient ended up having um, intracranial bleed that 
was a very poor outcome. Um, and so that was actually written up as a case study of like, we need to apply the same tenets that, um, you know, about patient safety and about distraction and screens um, in a meaningful way when we're talking to our trainees and in and, and, um, sort of completing tasks. And multitasking in general, we know from the from research, is just not, not necessarily a safe method. We all think we can do it well, but actually none of us do it very well. So <laughs> that's a great question. Thank you. Yes. I already knew that doctors hated the Yes. <laughs> it was interesting to learn that patients don't necessarily they don't, yeah. hate them so much, which fits with my personal experience. Mm -hmm. When I'm with my doctor and she's buried in her computer, I thought, well, she's buried in her computer, but it's like from the surface of taking care of me, kind of like, you know, my father was never around, but he was you know, supporting the, the household. Yes. Your work is interesting because it, it could help patients have a better view of EMRs. Mm -hmm. But maybe even more, it's helping doctors have a better view of EMRs and taking their classes. I hope so, and I think that goes back to you know the question around you know whether or not like that. If you think about the HR as an engagement um, opportunity and a way to connect with the patients, maybe that's a better perspective on it than um, seeing it as a, you know that that huge burden. That you know I think it is important. The, the physician perspective is very negative on the HR. We know that from the lay literature, from stuff that's published in the newspapers and you know opinion pieces, um, and it. And, and personal experience, um, but the patients actually are neutral or generally see the potential in it. So I do, I do think that the faculty perspective and the physician perspective is one that we can think about shifting a little bit because I think that will overall um, hopefully improve you know, the level of care and engagement with our patients. Yeah, Dan. Thank you. That's that, super interesting. Yeah, um, thanks for that question. Yeah, we, so um, Lolita and I have, uh, Dr. al and I have both um, uh, try to kind of think about integrating this at a higher level. Um, so we've presented at the Epic, Epic like user group meetings, which is sort of this like bizarre that they have in, you know, in Wisconsin where that's like Epic headquarters. And, you know, they, they have like this conference that has like, it's an incredibly attended and it's, um, it's, it's really meant to really think about issues like this. So we've had a chance to present there are two or three times now on this topic. Um, it's really hard. Their priority list of things they want to do is really quite high. Um, but, you know, we are working with the Gold Foundation um, to really think about ways that we can advocate for this type of um, integration and focus on communication with patient when the EHR is used. And maybe, the, you know, who wants another alert in their system? But maybe this is one that is actually, like, helpful. You know, like, maybe once we get a picture of the, of the patients, you know, in, in the epic chart, then the, their picture will pop up occasionally. You'll remember to, like, go over and look at them or something, right? Like, who knows? Um, but I think there are ways to nudge um, physicians to just remember a little more about that eye contact and that body positioning and that kind of stuff. Um, and we're, we're trying to figure out ways at a systems level to kind of integrate this um, in, in a meaningful way. And here at the Medical Center, Lee and I have been working um, to kind of roll out the comic at other um, clinics so that patients can also sort of start um, getting engaged. You know, we have a speak up program um, that exists already for patients to be able to bring up any concerns they have on their mind with their doctors, and we wanted to make this part of that speak up program. So hopefully you'll see a little more of this as far as from the patient um, advocacy empowerment piece here in the next few months. Yes? I mean, along those lines would be relatively simple, I would think, for them to implement a button for like <clears throat> viewing during the patient encounter where your other patient's names and information is hidden. Yeah. No, that's true. Yeah, so that gets at that, that HIPAA question of pr protecting privacy. I do think, so yeah, I mean, I, I honestly think that there's a lot of role in thinking about not just EPIC as that, like, um, you know, for the, the clinical enhancement is extremely important, right? We want to make sure, first and foremost, our EHR is able to really help us um, clinically and medically care for our patients. But this is another huge aspect of that, right? Like, sort of the ability to use it in a way that is meaningful with patients in the room, because that's what the majority of us do. We have to use the 
HR in the room with the patient. So I do think there needs to be a parallel, you know, tracking consideration um, with the EHRs to um, to really think about that. And I think more physician input is incredibly important in, in, in work like that, especially if it can potentially have an impact on how physicians perceive the EHR and in turn, you know, hopefully continue to nudge how patients are um, sort of uh, responding to the EHR as a positive tool. Oh, yes. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you Mark. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>